Welcome back to Big Sky Buckets. I'm Big Sky, and today we're talking the semifinals of the in-season tournament in Las Vegas. Talking about the winners and losers of each game, which teams are going to go to the championship round on Sunday, and talk a little bit about Las Vegas in general and how it didn't pan out the way I thought it would in terms of audience, uh, the audience interactions and the atmosphere of the games. But before we get started, if you're new to the channel, please consider subscribing. I'd really appreciate all the subscriptions as I get this thing up and going and put a lot more passion, effort into pumping out content, editing, all of that. And I'd really appreciate all the support. I'd appreciate if you'd like, comment down below. Let me know your thoughts. If you're an audio only listener, give it a rate, give it a listen. Let's get into it. So first thing is first. The crowd for the Vegas games, along with the scheduling of the games, was super bizarre because in the first game, it just didn't feel like the audience was really into it. They didn't really care about either team. And the, I just think that has to do with the fact that I don't know if it should be in Vegas until there's like a team in Vegas. Because I, it feels like it should just be in a neutral site somewhere else where team, like, I don't know. It, it feels like you need to get, you need to give it another week after you figure out who's going to go so that more fans of those teams, especially in the smaller markets like we saw Pacers Bucks, can book tickets ahead of time and fly over there and be a part of the game and the atmosphere. Because a lot of people from Vegas, I don't think they care too much about the Bucks or the Pacers. And that's not a knock against the small market teams. That's just a knock in general of, I think, the scheduling in general for this semifinals was kind of rushed in a way. And then secondly, you know, it worked well for the lakers pelicans game because most people in vegas are fans of the lakers so they were more into it but then in that way it kind of defeats the neutral site purpose where most of the fans are rooting for the lakers and you'll see that on sunday because the lakers were one of the teams that won along with the pacers but let's just jump right into Pacers, Bucks. So Pacers won. Pacers won 128 to 119. Tyrus Halliburton was amazing. 27 points, 15 assists. Incredible stuff. The main game plan here, it looked like, is A, the Pacers offense is just incredible. It's so fluid in the fact that they can beat you from all three levels. They're When they get a stop or create a turnover like they did a lot last night, the Bucks are at a massive disadvantage with their age and the fact that really it's it's Giannis versus the world because a lot of these guys are not fast enough to stop the transition offense of these this young run-and-gun style team. And that's where a lot of the Pacers' points were scored. It's just we're going to destroy you in transition with Obi Toppin, with Buddy Heald, Miles Turner, Tyrese Halberton, Andrew Nimhard. Benedict Mathurin, these guys are running and gunning. and Aaron Neesmith as well. So, you know, they're fast and they want to play very fast. And then the other thing in terms of the half court, when Tyrese Halliburton was cook, when Tyrese Halliburton was cooking dudes, it was because they would run a, they would do pick and roll from the perimeter between Tyrese and Miles Turner. And from there, it would be either Chris Moulton or Malik Beasley on Tyrese Halliburton originally and Brooke Lopez on Miles Turner. So the shooting guard or small forward of the Bucks is on Tyrese because he's a taller point guard. And then you'd have the center on center action. But Brooke Lopez, who I love, is a little slow footed and his best attribute is being a rim protector and drop coverage. Here, when he's switched onto, and you want to switch him. The problem is you want to switch him because if, Malik Beasley or Chris Middleton goes under the screen, you're going to die because that will give Tyrese enough time to get his interesting jump shot, to say the least, up and going, and he's so efficient from there, he'll probably beat you. The main thing here is it just takes a little bit more time for him to beat you when you switch Brooke onto Tyrese because Brooke is so slow-footed that Tyrese is going to put his moves on you, throw a hesitation move to say to give you the signal of, oh, he's about to go attack the basket. I'm going to take a step back. So Brooke takes a step back, and then Tyrese takes a step back as well, but to uh, from the perimeter, so he takes a step back three, has enough time, has enough space, it's money. And th they were matchup hunting Brooke in that exact way. So that's rough. The drop coverage, which worked against the Knicks, did not work as well here, solely because a lot of the players on the Pacers like to shoot mid-range shots as well. 
And so whenever they would try and attack the basket, Brooke Lopez and drop coverage would drop back there. And then they would just kind of stop on a dime and take a mid-range shot. And even though it's not as efficient of a shot, it worked very well. But really, the transition here was just immaculate from the Pacers. And then in the Bucks side of things, we just kind of discussed the defensive scheme here didn't work super well. Adrian Griffin went through his entire playbook defensively to try and stop Tyrese and could not do it. Look, it's understandable. He's looking like a top five offensive engine in the game. Offensive engine being a player that generates offense, not just from scoring, but passing as well. And he's doing an immaculate job with the number one offense in the league. The Bucks' problem here is that Dame and Chris Middleton need to play better in a game like this. And they did not. The box score is misleading. For If you just look at points, the box score is misleading from Dame's perspective and Chris Middleton's. Chris had 20 and Dame had 24, but they both had they both combined for about seven turnovers, which is bad because every single one of those basically turned into points for the Pacers who like to run and gun, as we talked about. And then just the efficiency, they just need to play better. They need to shoot better shots. And that that's more so on the Bucks' offensive schemes in plays that are being run. I think Adrian Griffin needs to get a little bit more creative than typically just running pick and roll all the time. You know what I mean? There's not as much to break down with the Bucks here. They just this might actually be a bad matchup for the Bucks just because the run and gun transition. It they need to say they need to get better at transition defense is obvious. I just don't really know how. They did a good job with the perimeter defense, which is surprising for a team that sucks with their perimeter defense, but the Pacers only made about, they went seven of 33 from three. So that's a good way to win in general, but the turnovers is what killed the Bucks because those turnovers turn into points for the Pacers because they're probably the best transition offense in the league. But that's really about it. Some questions about the Bucks, not as many concerns, but it is concerning of the Bucs probably don't want to see this team in the playoffs. The good thing for the Bucs in terms of seeing this team in the playoffs is that typically in the playoffs, the game slows down. But thing, the, the pros I said about the Pacers from the last time I talked about them versus the Celtics still remain of they have a, a few core guys that play very solid defense. And that's all they need, really, to be a solid team. So my questions about if the Pacers can play defense have been answered two games in a row. The answer is yes. When it matters most, they will. They're a young, up-and-coming team. Tyrese Halliburton looking like a superstar in the making right now. It's all good there. I just think the Bucks' inconsistencies at times have been more concerning. I think they will figure it out given they were on the track to. It's just this game kind of came out of nowhere. But let's move on to this one was the game of the day. This next one had the potential in my eyes to be the game of the day, but it died. That that concept died really early on. So Pelicans, Lakers. The story of this game can be summed up by two words. LeBron James. So this was a great game in the first quarter. And that was it. I want to read out some box score numbers for you because the box score is very indicative of what happened in this game. Brandon Ingram, nine points on 30% from the field. Zion, 13 points on 75% from the field. Jonas Valanciunas, nine points, 33% from the field. Herb Jones, who I think was the best Pelican player all night, 10 points, 40% from the field. You you get the you get the gist of where I'm going here. The Lakers defense was suffocating, but the real dagger in the heart was that LeBron James in the second quarter went absolutely nuclear and he never slowed down one bit. He came into the game and one of the first possessions he took a charge from Zion. And I kind of figured at that point, oh man, if he's playing this level of defense or he's really trying, the Pelicans might be in for a rough one. But the hustle plays that the Pelicans, the Pelicans had a lot of hustle plays in that first quarter, and then they all died because basically the Lakers stole their entire mojo, honestly. The Lakers started playing more hustle plays. LeBron didn't miss a three. He even, at one point, which <laughs> you got to come back now in hindsight, LeBron hits a heat check logo three in the second quarter. And at that point, you kind of just feel like, oh man, 
it's it's this bad. They couldn't stop LeBron at all. He was nine of twelve from the field. He had eight assists. He just he was making everyone else better on the field uh, on the court for his team, and he just eviscerated the Pelicans. There was no scheme to stop LeBron. Uh, like there was no scheme to stop Tyrese Halliburton in the first game, and yeah, this is really this is a LeBron game where at, still at the age of thirty eight, we can. He's about to turn 39 in a couple of weeks. We can say he's still that guy. Damn. I, I have no clue when he's supposed to, like when age is supposed to finally kick in and have him take a step back. I really thought at the first game of the season, I'm like, oh, they're going to keep him on a minutes restriction. That was thrown out the window super fast. In every year since the bubble, LeBron is like, AD, it's time for you to take the reins as number one option so I don't have to do as much. And AD every time is just too inconsistent for that to happen. So LeBron is like, all right, I'm going to do it myself. Man, he's still he's still just as good as he's ever been. <sighs> the jump shooting from him has been remarkable this season. And this is what you want to see. Well, I I don't even know if you sh should say that. If you see this, that means LeBron, the Lakers are a good team. The other thing here is that the... Pieces of the Lakers defensively were just some dogs out there. Cam Reddish on a contract year, on, because he's on a vet minimum and could easily be out of the league, has finally understood that his role is being a role player and playing as great defense as he can. He did. Jared Vanderbilt, incredible defense. Max Christie, incredible defense. It's just really good defenders around LeBron, and they were making their jump shots because... LeBron was on one for so long in this game that he just, like Tyrese Halliburton, that offensive engine is still alive within LeBron. He still create because he generates so much, like the gravity of this game was do not let LeBron get what he wants. And then that turns into LeBron generating a bunch of assists and hockey assists. They won the rebounding battle. They won the hustle plays after the first quarter. This, this, this was over by the half. And it really sucks because the main criticism of the Pelicans here is that it actually falls upon Zion, who had the best field goal percentage. But the defensive scheme with the Lakers was so ingenious of a switch, like the switch between the four and the five of LeBron to Anthony Davis completely and utterly negates everything that Zion brings. He gets to the rack super efficiently. But against AD and LeBron, two big, big bodies who were both playing immaculate defense, just negates that. And then the rest of the team on the Lakers can focus on everyone else. That's ju it's just tough. Cam played a great game on Brandon. Everyone else, like the whole scheme of the Pelicans is essentially is one of Brandon Ingram or Zion really needs to have it going. And then they draw the attention of the defense. And then that opens up for every other shooter like CJ, Herb. But Jonas had to shoot a lot of threes because AD was just locking up the paint so much that he just had to take more jump shots in general. That's also not what you want from Valanchunas as much. You do like him taking threes, but one of four is not great. This is the kind of game that I needed to see from the Lakers personally. A pure starting in the second beginning, the tip of the second quarter, this team played a perfect game. There's not much to say about the Pelicans in my eyes. This is more so of introspection of Zion. And you need to play more aggressive, even if AD and LeBron are in your face. You need to, the driving and kicking just kind of stopped. He was a lot more hesitant to take it to the rack when he saw the LeBron AD in the paint. And then pass it out. You need to still drive and then find a way to kick. That's the way it works with Zion. That's why I was so high on this team earlier. But Le LeBron and the Lakers neutralized it all. And they're going to the championship game. So for the championship game, I'll do my predictions now. Because I was, I mean, I got uh, most of the <laughs> predictions wrong. It's just a really good defense versus a phenomenal offense. I guess the question here is, will Tyrese Halliburton finally meet his match in terms of perimeter defenders or point of attack defenders like Jared Vanderbilt and Cam Reddish? 
being genuine nu nuisances to Tyrese because so far this year, just this year in general, haven't really seen it outside of like the Orlando Magic completely and utterly annihilating the Pacers. But one could probably make the argument that that might be an outlier for the Pacers so far, but they've only played the Magic once. You almost think that it's got to be LeBron to win it all, right? It This just feel he feel, he's looking like he's playing enlightened basketball right now. He, he's, he cares. He's playing defensively. He's playing incredible offensively. It's like he's gone back into his absolute prime. I'm going to pick the Lakers, even though I'm very high on the Pacers, just because experience. I'm going to pick experience. Also, like I said before, when they play here in Vegas, it's like a home court advantage because there's so many Lakers fans. So I'll go with that. If I'm wrong, you know, I'll come on here and apologize to Tyrese, even though I've been a big proprietor of him so far this year. Yeah, that's all I got for you guys today. Thank you so much for watching, listening. Sub, like, comment, all of that. And I will see you guys Sunday or Monday. We'll figure it out. I'll let you guys know. Maybe I'll put a post on, like, YouTube or Twitter or something about the scheduling. But look forward to the championship game on Sunday. That should be a really fun one. A really interesting dose of is the offense better? Is the power of the number one offense better than this incredibly suffocating defense that the Lakers have showcased? I guess we'll find out. All right, guys. Peace.